This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Welcome to The Writing Life, sponsored by Hoko Polizzo, the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society. I'm Carrie Brown, and I'm delighted to be here today with Edith Perlman. And I'm delighted to be here. Um, I want to begin today really by congratulating you, Edith. Um, Binocular Vision was published in 2005 by Books which is out of the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, um, a wonderful press. And the book's success has been absolutely extraordinary. And for all of us who have loved the stories, I think it has been fabulous. You've had people cheering on the sidelines. Yeah, um, thank you. The, um, as Ann Patchett said in her introduction to the book, these are lines I know you're familiar with, what you have in your hands now is a treasure, a book you could take to a desert island knowing that every time you got to the end, you could simply turn to the front cover and start it all again. So this has been my experience, and I know it has been the experience of many, many, many readers. Thank you. Um, before we begin with some questions for you today, um, Binocular Vision won the Penn Malamud Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. It was a finalist for the National Book Award, the Story Prize, the Los Angeles Times Prize, among other honors, and praise for the collection has been fulsome. A major glorious book, <laughs> said one reviewer. Please enter and rejoice, encouraged Yi Yun Lee. If you read, write, or teach short fiction, wrote Anthony Doerr, if you believe gorgeous, scrupulously made literature nourishes the soul, then you must read Edith Perlman. Why in the world had I never heard of Edith Perlman, asked Roxana Robinson in her review in the New York Times. She should be known all over the place. Perlman's view of the world is large and compassionate, delivered through small, beautifully precise moments. Her characters inhabit terrain that all of us recognize, one defined by anxieties and longing, love and grief, loss and exultation. These quiet, elegant stories add something significant to the literary landscape. Binocular Vision has been an extraordinary success, but it's important, I think, to establish that the collection arrives in the context of a long and very distinguished career. Um, three previous story collections, How to Fall, Love Among the Greats, and Vaquita, which, which have won their own awards along the way, many distinguished awards for those collections as well. Uh, you've published some 250 works, so short fiction and nonfiction, including travel essays, I know. Um, stories selected for Best American for the O. Henry Prize stories, um, new stories from the South. You've been a steady contributor to many literary journals, uh, Atlantic Monthly, Antioch Review, Shenandoah, lots and lots of them. Um, and I know that you have credited those magazines with their role in the conversation about uh, the American literary landscape. You've really populated those journals. Um, and uh, clearly for you, those journals are an important way to put stories out yes. before the public. Um, so your work has been a great pleasure and a great success, of course, for many, many readers. And uh, many congratulations Thank to you. you. Um, I thought we could start today with reading a bit, if you would. Um, you read, of course, last night from Inbound. Uh, and I have a very short section I'd like for you to read today. Uh, if you've marked it. So just the bottom of the page here, down to this break. Um, it's, uh, the, the story is, of course, about a young girl, Sophie, who goes with her parents on a, on a day trip to, uh, to Cambridge with her parents and her younger sister, Lily, who has Down syndrome. Uh, and in the course of the story, Lily, uh, Sophie and her parents become separated. It's a terrifying story. It's a story of very high anxiety. Um, and we never know, really, what will happen until the end of the story. And the section I want you to read is when Sophie is standing in Harvard Square at the kiosk, 
the news kiosk with which many people of course are familiar and looking up at all those journals so if you would just read that section uh, that would be lovely Sophie wriggling one arm out of the backpack decided to start with the French newspapers she was to study French next year anyway with the rest of the special class but she was pretty sure she wouldn't soar with the new subject. She was tied to her first language, hers and Lily's. Still, she'd learn the rules. She'd listen and sometimes talk. Now, staring at Le Monde, pretending that the man with the earmuffs had gone home, she let her eyes cross slightly, the way she wasn't supposed to, and she melted into the spaces between the paragraphs until she entered a room beyond the newsprint, a paneled room lit by candles, walled in leather volumes, the way she had wanted the fifth biggest library to look. Mm. Though more books had been written than she could ever read, she had realized that in the library she had visited. She would manage to read a whole lot of them in golden dens like the ones she was seeing. She would read as many as her parents had read. She would grow as large as her parents. Like them, she would study and get married and laugh and drink and hug people. Steadied by this vision, she let herself look further. Her life would be lived in the world, not in this paper house. She foresaw that. She foresaw also that as she became strong, her parents would dare to weaken. They too might tug at her clothing, not meaning to annoy. Lily would never leave her. She will always be different, darling, her mother had said. At the time, Sophie had thought that her mother meant, we will always be different. Now she added a new gloss, I will always be different. She felt her cheek tingle as if it had been licked by the sad, dry tongue of a cat. At full growth, Lily's head would be almost level with Sophie's shoulder. Lily would learn some things. Mostly, she would learn Sophie. They would know each other forward and backwards. They would run side by side like subway tracks, inbound and outbound, coextensive. She had to return to her family now. She had to complete the excursion. She moved her free arm into the strap and settled the backpack on her shoulders. She walked past the man in earmuffs without saying goodbye. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. I, I, I love that story. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you to read that section because it seems to me um, typical of, of the extraordinary degree to which you are knowing about the, the experience of children, and especially um, young adolescent girls. So I think, of course, about Sophie, who's sort of just below adolescence, really, um, but also about the title story from Binocular Vision, in which the protagonist is a young girl, and Luann Zerubin from um, uh, Girl in Blue with a Brown Bag, uh, or, or Angelica in Grand Ski. You've just, you're so smart about um, these, these sharp-eyed, smart, um, I think unpolished was actually the word that you used to describe Luann when you read that story at the Penn Malamud. I, I wonder if you could talk about what it is about adolescence or what it is about young girls that attracts you. How do you know so much about the way they are in the world? Well, partly because I was one, and probably for a prolonged time, the way <laughs> uh, people are today. I may have been an adolescent from 24 to 40. And uh, partly because I have observed them, partly because I have a daughter. But I think young girls on the brink of life, uh, on the brink of uh, sexual uh, knowledge, on the brink of perhaps marriage, are very interesting. They, uh, 
they are confused, they themselves are often wise, they themselves are often foolish. Um, so there's much, much to delve into in the, in the world of the uh, adolescent girl, and I enjoy it. I also like old people. Um, yes, I've noticed that too. Lots of stories in which we have old people and young people together. Um, and and you have them interacting. Of course, um, Girl in Blue with a Brown yes. Bag is a wonderful example of that. So you also like that uh, old people and young people trying to understand one another. One another, as yes. As well. Um, to come back to Inbound for a moment, there's, there's, uh, there's a, a, a line in that story that interests me so much. And it's, it's really toward the very end of Inbound. I hope it doesn't give away the story for readers to say this. Sophie is coming down the subway platform at the end of this long and completely harrowing day and sees her parents. And there is a, a character who appears just for a flash. She's appeared just for a moment beforehand. Um, she's, uh, I think your description of her, it's very, very um, economical. Uh, an old woman with a cart. Yes. And we know by this economical description, we've seen her, of course, as I said, too, just for a flash before, but we know that she's homeless, probably one of the homeless people. We know that she is, as so many homeless people are, perhaps mentally ill in some way. And yet she says, as Sophie appears on the platform, um, now your reunion. It's an absolutely brilliant moment in that story because you chose this character. She's sort of like a, a one-woman Greek chorus yes, in a way. She's a sort of dark prophetess to narrate what has taken place in, in this three story. Words. <laughs> in In three words. I wonder how that moment came to you as a writer and, and why you chose to bring her in to be the voice of the story at that moment. Well, I hope you won't be appalled <laughs> at, at how that happened. Um, this, I got this story from a dream, mm. which is every writer's dream. Yes. Um, but the dream was very short. It was only the reunion. Ah. I saw a seven-year-old walking down the concourse, and I saw her distressed parents and her younger sister. Um, and then I woke up, and I said to myself, well, uh, the gods of literature have given you a terrific ending. Now you've got to work to deserve it. And I did work very hard on the story, uh, but the ending never changed. Uh, endings often do, but this Isn't one that seemed to be a given. And the old lady was in the ending and said exactly that, um, now your reunion, which told me that this was going to have to be a story of separation and um, reun reuniting. Yes, so um, it's so Shakespearean. I mean, it's. <laughs> It's wonderful. So that is really an extraordinary account of how that voice appears in the story. It is a, it's a, it was a, ch it's a chillingly marvelous, almost operatic moment in the story, I think. Thank how fabulous you. that it came to you in a dream. Yes, it was wonderful. Ah! I, I, it has never happened since or before, and I, I suspect it was my one moment, uh, the Coleridge moment. Yes, yes. Well, a certainly a divine detail, if nothing else. Um, well, I want to take you back now, in, in fact, to your own young life a little bit um, and ask you about uh, your influences, um, both early and late. You have a wonderful essay, um, Reading My Mother, in which you chart your relationship with your mother through the writers and the books that you read together. So. Cheever and Carson McCullers and Nabokov, though not Lolita, with, of which your mother did not approve. Um, and you said in that essay, of course, as you have said before in, in other interviews, that Dickens was and, and has remained for you uh, a, a marvelous um, pleasure. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about why Dickens. I've, I actually have gone back to Dickens, who I have not read since I was in probably high school to reacquaint myself with Dickens. Um, and I, I would love to hear what it is especially about, about his work that, that moves you so much. Well, I think, uh, first of all, the language. Uh, mm. Dickens was a master of metaphor, of, uh, of the telling detail, 
of giving a character a um, way of being and then repeating it over and over again. Uh, there's a man called Wemmick in, um, I think it's in Great Expectations, whose mouth is like a postal slot. Mm. And he is described every so often, not as Wemmick, but as the postal slot. <laughs> I, I love that kind of I mm. love that kind of attention. I think the plots, though sometimes over dramatic, are compelling. The characters are wonderful, with the exception of certain young women uh, who are uh, stiff and um, unremarkable. Mm. Um, I interested that you haven't read Dickens since high school. I think everyone is assigned. You have Tale of Two Cities here. Uh -huh. Probably every high school student is assigned that book or David Copperfield, and they are too young. And mm. what happens, I think, is that the 17-year-old or the 15-year-old gets through the book because uh, he or she wants to They're get, dutiful. Uh, nice. Yes, and wants to pass and go to Harvard and all that. Um, but it, it doesn't read Dickens again because it's uh, it's just hasn't been a pleasure enough. I also read Tale of Two Cities in high school and maybe a few others, but I felt, oh, he isn't for me, he's too long-winded, and who cares about uh, these people running around England? Until one day, I, I think at 30, uh, in, a, in a paperback bookstore, I came upon the novel Our Mutual Friend, mm. which is Dickens's last novel and I think his best. And I, I took it because it had a kind of gruesome cover and I was in that mood. Mm. And then I put it on my table and didn't read it for another few months. But when I did read it, I realized that I was, I was in the presence of a master, which I hadn't realized at 18, and how lucky I had been to pass that store, that aisle, and see that cover. Um, so I resumed reading Dickens and I read about three novels a year. So I've read mm. um, each of them. I should know how many there are, but I can't remember. Each of them many, many times, mm. and it's a great pleasure. So you're mostly then a reader of stories if you are only reading three novels a year. Oh, no, but I read other novels. Ah, OK. Oh, oh you read three of his? Three of his a year, ah, yes. OK. Yes. OK. Yes, just to keep up our friendship. Okay. Well, I'll have to go look now for that. I mean, it really did pull me back to Dickens. Chekhov, I think, is also a writer like that, that you're forced to read in college. I was too young to read Chekhov. It wasn't until I was 40 years old that I somehow rediscovered those stories. Actually, I think it was the anthology that Richard Ford, with that, yes, that's with a that good beautiful, yeah. beautiful introduction that he wrote. Who's, and he says in that, act, that introduction, People have been telling me that Chekhov is wonderful. I didn't think he was right, wonderful. Right, right. Uh, um, so you have to be old enough to, to I think, uh, appreciate the brevity, the economy, and as in a lady with uh, the lady with a little dog, the yeah. uh, what he suggests rather than says what he trusts the reader to understand. Mm. Yeah. Well, now we'll now we will all go back to Dickens. With <laughs> Dickens, Chekhov. Yes, with renewed renewed <clears throat> enthusiasm and ability, presumably too. Um, I think one of the most striking things about your stories is the the extraordinary bedrock of general knowledge that rests within them. They're so smart about so many things about history and about music and about literature and art and travel and the world. Um, there's a character in one of your stories, Gail, in The Little Wife, who's a teacher, and she calls herself, I think, a pseudo-erudite. She's very funny, um, as, of course, many of your characters are. I wonder if you would talk just a little bit about your own education. I know you went to Radcliffe, um, and about how you have come to know so much about so many things. Well, thank you. I don't. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do a great deal of research for mm. all my uh, erudite stories so that um, I do know a little bit about music, a little bit about art, uh, a little more about literature, nothing about the Russian Revolution, uh, so that when it came time to write a story uh, that referred to the, the czar and his family, I had to read about seven books. So that is where I get ah. my, my uh, erudition. I get it from 
the library. From the erudite. From the, right? <laughs> that's right. That's, uh, I'm a pseudo erudite, just like my character. Ah, so, you are, so you are a researcher. I am a researcher. Mm. I love to read. Yeah. Well, that's not so surprising, I guess. Um, your story, Homeschooling, contains a beautifully uh, sympathetic portrait of the mother who is a computer programmer in the sort of early days of the technology. And the description of her in that story, it's a heartbreaking story, the description of her in that story, the kind of intensity of her focus, the quality of her attention, her ability to stay with a task for a long um, period of time is, is really marvelous. Um, and I know that you too worked as a computer programmer for a while. Could you talk about how you made that, that switch from computer programmer to writer, or maybe they ran concurrently, coextensively, <laughs> um, uh, and whether or not you think there is anything that those two tasks have in common, the task of the computer programmer and the task of the writer. Well, when I, to when I think of computer programming, it's the computer programming that was done in the 1960s. Uh, before the PC, before before anything, but certainly before any of those little things that the kids are playing with, um, the computer in those days was the size of a a very large barn, and uh, all of us programmers worked on teletypes, which were connected to the computer by cables. So it's nothing like the PC, and I don't know if there is any. It's nothing like your desktop. I don't know if there's any connection uh, from the, uh, to the programming that is done now with writing. But the programming that was done then was done in what was called computer language, mm -hmm. which was a language. Uh, it was a language with a vocabulary, and each word of the vocabulary had its function and could not be misused and mm -hmm. could not be misplaced. And that, I think, was the connection to writing, the, yeah. the seriousness about a word, even though the word was not uh, a word in any language we speak. It was still a word in a grammar and a syntax. And uh, so it was an easy transition. Yes, and those, those uh, you don't want to make mistakes in that vocabulary, obviously, you as can. a computer programmer. Yes, yes, and of you... course, you don't make those mistakes as a writer <laughs> well. either. Um, uh, that's very interesting. Um, that that story also made me think about. I, I know, of course, that you're uh, a, a wife and a mother. You have two two sons, I believe. Two, uh, one two of children, each. one yes. of each, mm -hmm. and, a, and a grandson. And a grandson. Um, you know, nobody ever asks men about how they balance their lives as uh, husbands and fathers with their writing life. Well, women are always being asked that, and in some ways, it's a tiresome question. But I think it occupies women, women writers, more. And that, that story and the children's response to their mother, their tremendous respect for that zone that she goes into when she is working, um, made me think about, of course, your own life as a writer and how you balanced or tried to balance, juggled being a mother with the life of an artist, which is living in that tremendously private, inviolable space. What was that like for you when you were raising your children when they were young? Well, when I was raising my children, uh, I used to write my stories maybe three or four hours a day when they were young. They had a babysitter those three or four hours. When they were older, they were in school. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a terrible conflict, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say it because it is uh, not, 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 not the thing that people believe, but it was not a conflict. If, if I had the three or four hours a day, I could then devote myself to my children or whatever needed to be done. I was never much of a cook, so that was also <laughs> not a conflict. <laughs> but so it was, you had these two things going side by side, and it was a nice, it was enough, that was enough time for you. Yes, and I also didn't do much else. Right, okay. Well, I know you also worked in a soup kitchen, of course. That was and, later, though. And, and those stories, all the Donna's Ladle stories, which are wonderful, wonderful stories. I, I, I want to ask you, and these, this question comes from Donna's Ladle, really, from those stories, but, but also from something I'm, I'm very aware of in your work, which is the degree to which characters feel or are aware of their responsibility, their ethical responsibility to 
you know, what we might sort of quaintly call the poor, you know, refugees or people who are unfortunate. And, and of course, your relationship with Rose Rappaport Moss and her own uh, gaze out into the world uh, in a sympathetic fashion, looking at people who are immigrants, who are transplants, who are exiles. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you feel the poor are always with you. I think there's a moment in one of your stories in which uh, I can't remember now who the character is. Says it to another character. Says it to Peter Loy. She says, you feel the poor are always with you. Do you feel the poor are always with you? Well, it would be grandiose to say so, I think. <laughs> but yes, I feel the, uh, not necessarily the poor, but, but, the, but people with misfortune yes. are never very far from my mind. The sick, for instance. Yes. Uh, uh, and the, the unhappy, uh, the shunned. Uh, people who like the younger sister in uh, in inbound will always be some on the outside. Yes, they are they are always with me to some degree. I do have fun writing about people who are having fun in life and not having bad luck, but I don't tend to them too much. They can take care of themselves. So I I write about people in bad situations perhaps economic or perhaps health or perhaps uh, political. Well, and outsiders, too. And outsiders, think, yes. You know, many of your stories, of course, there's a great geographic range. Many of the characters in your stories are travelers, are tourists, are visitors. And that role of the outsiders yes. is also obviously of interest to you. Yes. Um, I, I think that one of the things that is surprising about your stories is how short they are. <laughs> yes, they are They're short. marvelously, marvelously compact. Uh, somebody called your stories, they gave it a sort of serene precision. Is that a term that you like, that description of serene precision of your stories? I like precision a lot because that's what I aim for. Serenity it seems to me um, neither the atmosphere of my stories nor Mm. nor my own feelings. Uh, when I'm writing a story, I'm anything but serene. Uh, I'm glad if it appears that way to, uh, to a reader, but uh, precision is very important to me. Um, as I said last night, um, I don't want to take up too much of people's time, so I make my stories as economical, precise. Uh, I use a, as few words as possible. Well, that serene surface, I think, uh, rides over these tremendous emotional landmines, these huge fault lines, which of course the story then reveals. But they're so gracefully done. The story is beautifully gracefully done. Edith, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure for me to meet you and to ask you these questions and to have such wonderful answers. Thank you for your marvelous, marvelous stories. Carrie, thank you for being such a wonderful interviewer and um, giving me an opportunity to talk about my stories. And thanks to Hoko Polizzo for inviting me here. Um, and I am delighted to be in Maryland for the first time in my life. Thank you, Edith, very much. This has been The Writing Life, sponsored by Hoko Polizzo, the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society. I'm Carrie Brown, and I've been speaking today with Edith Perlman. <laughs>